One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey, everybody. It's Sam Jacobs. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. We're excited today to have on the show Lori Richardson. Lori is a really well-known thought leader and speaker in the sales community. She she founded Score More Sales in 2002, which is her sales consulting sales training business. And she founded Women Sales Pros in 2014. And she's passionate about pursuing, advocating, and furthering the cause of female sales leadership, female sales executives, and just helping women make sure that they don't hit that glass ceiling and that they advance through their career. So it's a really good conversation. She you know, she started off as a teacher and a single mom and moved into sales after that. She's seen pretty much every trend there is in the sales scheme of things. And I think it's just a really, it's a really good, it's really inspiring, it's a really empowering conversation. So I hope you enjoy it. Now, before we get there, we want to thank our sponsor. Our sponsor for today is Outreach. They are the number one sales engagement platform, as you know. Outreach revolutionizes customer engagement by moving away from siloed conversations to a streamlined and customer-centric journey. Leveraging the next generation of artificial intelligence, the platform allows sales reps to deliver consistent, relevant, and responsible communication for each prospect every time, enabling personalization at scale that was previously unthinkable. Outreach produces incredible industry-leading events like their Unleashed Conference, I've been, and it is very, very good, and their City by City Unleashed Summit Series roadshows, along with top-notch thought leadership content. Check them out at www.outreach.io. Without further ado, no more adus. We're done with the adus. No further adus. Adus can go. We're done with you, adu. Uh, Let's listen to my interview with Laurie Richardson. Hey folks, welcome back to the Sales Hacker Podcast, wherever you are. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe and sound and your loved ones are safe and sound. Today on the show, we've got a woman that a lot of people know in the sales world and a lot of women look to for inspiration, and that's Lori Richardson. Let me read you her bio really quickly. Lori Richardson wants to literally change the face of sales and sales leadership in B2B companies, especially tech. She's been in the world of sales for longer than most. She's a top sales influencer, grew up selling from the time she had a lemonade stand on a dead-end street, and believes sales is the ultimate profession. She loves watching ice hockey, is a former musician, and used to be a fundraising auctioneer. She's president of the Boston chapter of the AAISP, is a founding member of the Sales Enablement Society, advisor for several companies and organizations, including the Sales Education Foundation. Lori, welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Thank you, Sam. It's wonderful to be here. We're excited to have you. So really quickly, we like to just, uh, again, uh, the folks that have been listening for a little while, hear hear me say this word one million times, but we like to contextualize your expertise. So tell us just about your business. Let's give you an opportunity to tell us what you do, what your consulting services are, and and then we can go from there. Sure. I, I started a sales consulting business in 2002 seems like forever ago. And about seven years ago, changed the way I did business. So it involved a lot more data. So now I work with companies on figuring out a lot of different data points about their sales teams and then help them make sense out of it and be more effective and productive. I also started Women's Sales Pros about six years ago, which is an organization to get more women into sales and sales leadership. So tell us a little bit about that. What what does Women's Sales Pros do specifically to accomplish that objective? We have a group of 50 women sales experts. Many people have heard of, you know, Trish Bertuzzi and Sherry Levitin, who I know was just on your show, Jill Conrath and Colleen Stanley, and just a a great group of 50 women. We also have a commercial side of the house where we consult with companies to help them find, hire, uh, retain, and promote women in, in sales. So I was doing quite a bit of that until the pandemic hit. And you can imagine that, you know, suddenly... There are a lot of things that you had to go back down to the basics. And so some of that's on hold right now. But what I really like, Sam, is that some of the companies that I was working with, some said, you know what, we just can't deal with this. We're not working on anything to do with how we're go- our sales teams are going to look. We just have to survive. Other people said, you know, this is important. Inclusion is still a commitment to us and we'll, we'll just put it on hold for now. And I, and I think how people message things is really important these days. Yeah, I agree with you. And I want to talk about 
because you're doing a lot of coaching right now and a lot of training through the pandemic on how to modify your approach. But the first thing I want to hear about is your your quote unquote origin story, because I think it's pretty inspiring. So tell us, how'd you get to this point in your career and walk us through the origins of your career in sales and and um, let's hear about that. Yeah, I, I grew up in my grandmother's clothing store and my grandmother had a high-end women's apparel store. She had several of them actually. And I left that and ended up becoming a teacher. So I thought I would be a teacher because that's, that was my lifelong dream was to teach from the time I was very young. And I became a single parent in my early 20s. So what I realized is I couldn't afford to be a single parent on a teacher's salary, at least where I was, which was in in the Seattle area. And so I drew on my childhood and just growing up in this business where I, I always knew that I knew how to sell, which is kind of unusual, especially for a woman. And I knew that maybe I could sell something technology related. And and so I ended up getting into the tech boom of the 80s, which was huge. And basically you could be an innocent bystander and, and kind of get swooped into this and, and make a decent living. So it was quite a great start. And I, you know, have never looked back. I've been in sales in one capacity or another ever since. What were you selling when you went in, in that part of the, the tech boom? Yeah, I was I was selling the first personal computers and wow. the Apple Apple had computers that they had in schools and I sold the first business computers that Apple made. The Macintosh is what it was called originally and IBM had computers and Compaq, which ended up being acquired, um, a, a number of different Hewlett Packard had computers, so all sorts of PCs and peripherals and um, training and services. Ended up working with some very large companies and very large deals, and and it was really great. It was it was a my first job. There was no issue about being a woman. And I worked with this amazing group of folks. Some of us still keep in touch, but subsequent positions were not the same where I had to really sell myself over and over again and take less pay and a number of different things. So I'm glad that I had a really f- good first initial career. You know, my first job in sales went really, really well because it, I, I, I know some people that get really turned off by their first sales experience and they end up leaving when they might have just had the wrong boss or the wrong company or the wrong products and services. What do you think you've been doing this quite a while? So yeah. what do you if you if you were to extract a few high level themes, what do you think's changed about the discipline, the art, the science of selling since and I'm sure many, many things, but you yeah. know, comparing it to when you first started selling desktop computers yeah. through the dot com boom of two thousand you know, yeah. nineteen ninety nine yeah. to today. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. There are always new things, there are always changes and iterations, and there's always a lot that stays the same. For example, even during this pandemic that we're dealing with, I've heard people say, Oh, you know, don't sell. You can't sell right now because people don't want to hear that. And I believe that if you are a consultative salesperson, you're a helper. Salespeople are the helpers. And and right now, doctors and nurses and, you know, everyone on the front lines are the true heroes. But the salespeople, those in sales that can help take ideas and products and services and turn them into dollars for companies to help them grow and be able to support their communities again, those, you know, those are heroes too. And, and salespeople, they're going to be the ones that help get this economy back, the balance as we call it. So how do you, what is the advice that you're giving folks during the pandemic? You know, you hear that phrase, I'm afraid to sell or it's not the right time. So is it a, is it a messaging thing? Are you advising different communication channels? What's your, what's your approach? Yeah, it's, it's been debated. You'll see it debated on LinkedIn quite a bit. You you can't just, you know, hide. You, You have to talk to your existing and clients. I always talk to past clients because I feel like they're always clients of mine and, and future, future clients, people that don't, uh, there aren't your clients yet just to have a conversation. And 
if you have a product or service that truly could help them during this time, then it's upon you to initialize a conversation in some manner. And it may just be, hey, Sam, how are things going? I'm not really sure. You know, it looks look like based on who you work with, you, you guys are probably doing okay, but I, you know, I'm not sure. And I just, I just wanted to check on you. And most people will take that really well. You know, if, if you're having a hard time, you're going to say, you know, now's not a good time. And, and that's going to be that. And, and just like any time in selling, I, I wouldn't, tr- I wouldn't be any different, uh, maybe more empathetic, but you know, a good salespeople are always empathetic. What do you think, you know, looking across, I mean, a lot of folks have a point of view on what makes a great salesperson and you're coaching, you know, individual reps, I'm sure, in addition to managers and leaders, what are the key qualities? You know, do you have a framework that you're, that you're teaching against when you think about what makes a great salesperson? What is it? Yeah. So I believe very strongly after a lot of proof over the last six or seven years that there are 21 core sales competencies. And the most important are what we call the will to sell. So that comes down to desire and, you know, it's desire for sales success and it's also commitment to sales success. And also being motivated, having a good outlook, taking responsibility. No, those aren't the conventional tactical things that we teach people, but that's that's part of what it takes to be a top seller. And in addition to that, there are tactical, there are a number of tactical skills that you know you add on being consultative and being able to sell value and qualifying and closing and all those kinds of relationship building skills. So There are definitely some set skills that we look for and that we know will make someone more successful than not. So thinking about the will to sell, help us define, uh, you know, desire and commitment specifically. Is it, I think a lot of people sort of think of themselves as committed, but is it a simple definition when you're, when you're sort of trying to evaluate them through that lens or is it, does it mean something more? Yeah. I I mean, I use a tool to help tell that. So I have a number of questions that we would normally ask someone, but desire is really the fact that you want something so badly. You want to be successful in this role. You're going to win no matter what pandemic is thrown at you. you. You are going to commit every day. And then that commitment piece is that you're going to do whatever it takes to be successful. It, it doesn't matter. You're there. You're showing up. You're up at you know 7 a.m., 8 a.m., whatever it is. And, and it's not about working more hours, although it seems like a lot of people are working harder now, um, but it's really about learning about your buyers and learning about who their customers are and learning what the challenges are and learning what opportunities and seeing if you can pivot your offerings. You know, that takes desire and commitment and an outlook and responsibility. Do you think these are coachable, developable things? Are they innate? What's your perspective on it? So my experience is that some of it is coachable and some of it isn't, but you know, time always tells. So one thing, coachability in itself is something that I want to measure and see whether someone is coachable or not. If you're not coachable, then it doesn't matter what I try to do. And that's why training is such a big industry with so much waste in it because people spend so much on training, but they don't know if they're working with reps who are coachable, who do have a good outlook, who are motivated. And we don't know whether their managers are going to support their efforts and reinforce and, and repeat, you know, all the, the knowledge and the insight. So do is the, and to your point, I guess there's a testing framework. I'm sure a lot of people are out there thinking, I'd like to know, of course, I don't want to waste money trying to t- teach people if, you know, f- teach people that aren't teachable, but right. how do I determine if they are teachable? Yeah, it's, it was a kind of an aha moment that I had because I was a reactive trainer. So people would hire me and they'd say, Hey, we're doing this uh, event offsite. Could you do a half day on this or that? Uh, could you do, you know, a session on social selling, what, whatever it is. 
and I would tailor it and I'd put a lot into it. People would like it. They give me a very positive review, but I could never measure the value. You know, how much did that help you, Sam? And you'd say, I, I don't really know. And so it made me go back to figure out, you know, if I could measure a sales team before I did any training or coaching, and then I could measure it afterwards, wouldn't that be more effective? So that's what I do now. So it's, it's a whole process that we put in place and I'm happy to talk to any any listeners about it that, that have questions. What are the fundamentals of the process? Fundamentals are taking an, an evaluation online and answering a bunch of questions and then we crank out the data. So it, it has to do with not just sales reps, but also within a company, how they interact with their sales managers and VP sales and the systems and processes that they have in place you know, and actually the pipeline as well. Got it. Yeah. You know, I do want to ask you about women in sales. So, yeah, you know, that's a big initiative and the, the organization that you started, Women Sales Pros, why do you think... I guess I understand from a kind of not, it's not philanthropic, but just an equality perspective. We want there to, but, but why do you think it's so important to have diversity in sales? The most important reason now, Sam, is because you need, you need a selling team that matches who your buyers are. We've seen this in many instances lately where you know, people just aren't going to settle for what used to work. And they want a diverse group of folks helping them who are listening to what it is that they need. And the other advantage to having diversity inclusion on a sales team of all types is that you have different answers to problems. I saw an instance for myself once where I took over a sales territory from someone else and a company had not let us bid on a huge project because they didn't like the rep. The rep was a guy, he happened to be very egotistical and I was very egoless at the time. I hope I still am (laughs) at least to, to some, some, some point, but I just had a whole different style. And because of that different style, I got an opportunity. We won a huge deal because of it. And that happens all the time. So it takes different sets of eyes, different questions, you know, different sets of empathy to, to work together. And we know that that happens in business, that boards that are diverse are more successful. Leadership that's more diverse is more successful. It's the same with sales teams. Yeah, I, b- I believe that. So, I guess tactically, I hadn't I hadn't uh, thought about this, but do you think that is there more of a need, just regardless of the of the the demographic diversity? Do you think we should be rotating accounts more often within a sales team because of the fact that maybe different approaches or can uncover opportunities that people thought were dead or, or closed lost? It's an interesting idea, isn't it? I mean, I would have hated that when I was a rep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take my account away, right? But there's a lot to be said, and you know, team selling. There's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. What do you? Uh, you were talking. You were telling me before that some of the some of the folks that have said that uh, women, just diversity in general, diversity is an, a priority for us, and now they're saying. I don't know about that. It's a pandemic. We're just trying to stay alive. What's your response to that? And how do we make sure that diversity and inclusiveness stays a priority, even as we're trying to make sure that the economy stays yeah. afloat? Yeah. And it, you know, it really got me thinking because you, I, I don't want to be promoting something that's just a nice to have. I don't think that diversity is just a nice to have. Some people think that it it's what we should do with should in quotes, but I, I think it's much more than that. And I think today when we're working to get this economy going again, which, you know, we're not even quite at that point, but maybe by the time this airs, we'll be working to get the economy going and it will take all hands on deck and it, and it will take diverse points of view like we were talking about. I just think that it's, it's a requirement now more than ever. I think that, you know, we know that women have a very good dose of empathy, communication skills, listening skills, 
these are all things that we need in, in the new, uh, the new economy going forward. Yeah, I agree. You, you mentioned that you, you know, you've been asked to comment or teach a course or give a session on social selling. Walk us through from your perspective, because you're, you're pretty active on LinkedIn. What do you think the keys to social selling, particularly because right now, you know, we're, we're recording this on April 7th, but everybody is at home. You know, people are spending even more of their lives online. I mean, we were already spending most of our life online, but right. now it's now it's 99% instead of 98%. Yeah. <laughs> What's your advice to people to make best use of platforms like LinkedIn? Because I think there's a lot, I don't know if there's different uh, advice. I just think people interpret the same advice differently, which is typically, you know, start creating content, try to make yourself a thought leader. And sometimes it, it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. I think, it, you know, depending on who your audience is, I mean, I, I work with salespeople, I work with sales leaders and I work with company leaders and they're all on LinkedIn. So that's my audience. And, and I think that you have to know who you're selling to for a lot of folks. I know, um, sales hacker has a big SaaS following and tech following. And the, a lot of those folks are on LinkedIn. A lot of your customers are on LinkedIn. So that, it, that matches up really well, but maybe some of the folks that I work with in manufacturing, their customers aren't necessarily on. Maybe they will be, maybe they are now. I should, I definitely should follow up and check on that. But, um, but first go where your customers are, go where your buyers are, go where your future buyers are and talk about their world, not, not about your world. It was hard for me when I started out because I started blogging long before I got on LinkedIn. And I used to just start by seeing what other people were doing and trying to amplify that. And I think that's a really good first step. Don't you, Sam? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I remember when uh, we were first talking about, I used to work at a company that sold to private equity firms and everybody was asking, how do we make use of Twitter or social media? And the first step was always try liking something, commenting on something or retweeting something just as a way of getting, dipping your toe in the water. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and on LinkedIn, you know, comment and share your point of view. Try not to derail the conversation because no, nobody likes that. That's, that's not a good thing to do, but I don't think anyway, if you have your own, you know, if you have a lot to say, write a post. So for example, someone made a comment about something to do with men and women in sales. And I had a whole lot to say about it. So I wrote a separate post and then I told the person that, you know, I had written this and if they wanted, you know, I'd be happy to share the link. So I didn't post the link until they said, oh, please share it. And then I did. And I was able to say all the things that I wanted to say. So that's, it's a good way, but, you know, try not to lurk. People a lot of people lurk. A lot of women in sales that I know lurk because they're not sure of their voice. And I think that at some point, you know, you have to just put a stake in the ground and say, you know, I've been doing my job for two years, three years, five years. Here's what I've learned. You know, here are the five things I've learned and and just start from there and just, and and take your time. Makes a lot of sense. When you, besides the fact that clearly, you know, we still need to lead with empathy right now and you're having conversations with because you mentioned, you know, you're still, you're, you're, you know, your, your business is doing relatively well and you're continuing to work with your clients and providing guidance and support besides, you know, don't stop besides, you know, yes, people are still uh, buying things and you need to lead with empathy. Are there specific, um, you know, pieces of advice that you find yourself giving right now to help people strategize, to help people be more effective, to help people, you know, one of the things we're hearing a lot of is just push deals, deals. It's not that the deal is dead, but it's that the, the deadline's extended. So how are right. you coaching reps through this environment besides just, Hey, not saying that they're not going to be buying is not an excuse. People are going to be buying stuff. We just need to do it the right way. What right. else are you selling them? Yeah. So yeah, pushing things out is a great strategy. It's like, let's just table it for now. We don't have that deadline. Like we said we did, you know, we'll, we'll push it out. I think really it, it goes down to really knowing who you're working with. And I mean, you know, we, we lost a number of opportunities. We also postponed a lot of opportunities and we had to pivot because one of the things that, that we did a lot of was helping companies to hire better, to hire better sales reps. And we're not doing any of that right now. 
we're doing some actually with some existing clients who are, you know, the companies that are hiring, they are using those services, but we're not selling that service right now, but we will again. And so we had to pivot to then focus on, well, are you retooling your sales team? Do you want to know who's on it? And do you want to know how strong your sales management is in a remote setting and things like that? So being ready for everybody to to pivot your message and and really be able to help your buyers today or let them know that, you know what, maybe we could talk about the future. We'll be all positioned for, you know, when we get out of this. So I, I think there's some intermediate discussions going on and then then some planning for the future and then helping them as you can right now. Some of the managers I'm talking to are dealing with this, with this, the reality that they haven't been particularly adept or haven't had to be great remote sales managers, <laughs> right? Particularly for field sales teams, because yeah. there's a group of sellers out there that are used to being on a plane, shaking hands, yeah. going to dinner. You know, um, what what's your advice to both the te- the people managing those field reps and the field reps themselves that are now? find themselves, you know, trapped in a home all day. Yeah, I know. It's, not used to that. it's gotta be tough for a lot of folks. Um, I would over communicate as a leader. I would want to have a stand up meeting every day. I, I want to hear what they're working on, what they're excited about. I mean, I, I would want my reps to be accountable, whether they are field reps or, or not. Everybody should be accountable for their time in some manner. And I don't mean micromanaging, but I want to know what you're working on today, Sam. And I want to know what you're excited about. And then tomorrow I want to know, you know, what's different because it's really easy. And I think we've all found ourselves kind of becoming jello, you know, just it's so easy to just, just space out and just, you know, this is something none of us have ever dealt with. So with understanding and empathy, there are expectations for people to find ways to, to work. And, and I think that there are companies that are finding that their messaging is off. And I think that there are reps that are finding that their, their product or service isn't fitting right now. And those are the ones that are going to have a tough time. Yeah. They, and do you feel like, are you advocating or telling your clients? Because again, thinking of folks that maybe haven't, I feel like over the last couple of years, and you can tell me if you disagree, but that the emphasis on activity driven metrics in the absence of direct correlation of those metrics to outcomes has fallen out of favor a little bit. And I hear a lot more people talking about, you know, uh, Rob Jepson talks about purpose-driven activities, PDA, not just number of connects, number of calls, but the things that that lead to, you know, a specific outcome. Yes. At the same time, I'm sure there's a bunch of managers out there that now have field reps and they're just saying, we got to move the pipeline. We got to do something. And I have no visibility into what you are doing all day. What are you, what's your suggestion to those folks? Do we need to immediately move into tooling or how do you tackle that challenge? Yeah. I mean, I think for some, there's some tooling that might need to be done because there are ways you can get visibility of what your teams are doing, certainly. And there are definitely ways to find out what's going on. I mean, maybe have more conversations than not. If, if you can't see what your rep is doing, that's a precarious position. And, and I think this, it might be a gift, not that this situation is a gift that's happening, but we're going to all change the way we do business because of this. And I think that it's, it, there's probably some glaring issues that are facing leaders, company leaders, as well as sales leaders, because we just didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what our reps were working on, or we, you know, they, they weren't putting the time in that we needed with facing the buyer and dealing with our buyers and, and prospects and clients. So, yeah, I think there's a whole bunch that's going to be, uh, that the, the, some wounds that are going to be open and, and some issues going forward. You're a small business owner. What do you, what's been your your response on behalf of your business to the pandemic. And I guess, you know, this is a question we ask all the time to, uh, within uh, the community I run revenue collective, but how long do you think, how long do you think this is going to last? Like, what's your, what's your plan for, uh, you know, for your consulting business as you look out at the next, you know, 12 to 18 months? 
Well, we are, you know, the thing about people in sales with a background in sales is that we're flexible, right? We're, we're good at, we're chameleons. We can, we can listen and flex and change. And so I'm, I'm very fortunate that I feel that that's part of the makeup of our organization is that we will bounce back. We will continue to grow. We will continue to help. And I don't know how long it's going to take. I I tend to be very, you know, I'm an optimistic person, but not in a everything's fine here (laughs) kind of a way. I mean, there's definitely an issue. We've been through other issues, but there's nothing like this that we've been through. So I don't have an exact answer. I just know that every day I'm going to get up and I'm going to work to help people to grow their revenues. And sometimes I'll be exchanging currency for that. And sometimes I won't be. And we're going to keep doing that until we get this economy going again, because like I said, those of us in sales, we will be the ones helping to solve this problem with the economy. That's exactly right. Lori, we're coming to uh, to the end of our time together. And, and in this part of the conversation, what we like to do is sort of pay it forward and think about some of the people, or it could be content, books, but you know the, the big influences on you that you think we should know about uh, in terms of leaders or authors or whomever. So when that when we think about who are the people that have influenced you that you want us to know about, who who comes to mind? People of influence. You know, we I have a group of 50 women sales experts <laughs> at womensalespros.com. And I guess my my thing is that often on LinkedIn in particular, when someone will put out a list of the top sales books or the top sales podcasts, of which this is always one. Very few are written by women. Very few books are written, listed that are written by women. Very few podcasts are done by women. And I have a whole list of books that are written by women in sales. And and so I love to talk those up, not because I think they're better, but I think they're different. And I think that if you have women on your sales team and they always just see that everything's done by men, that they're not going to want to be leaders themselves. And so it's my job to help model that and to help encourage other women to, and men to showcase things that are done by women. So, so you have in the podcast of Sherry Levitin, that's one that I'm going to talk up. There are a, a lot of really great women that are leading sales teams in, in SAS and tech and elsewhere. And, and I love talking about them and interviewing them and sharing what they're doing. Fantastic. Who besides Sherry, give us one or two more names to the point of helping make sure that people know some of the great women out there. Amy Franco. She wrote a book called The Modern Seller, which is fabulous. Um, Julie Hansen is a former actor and she wrote a book called Act Like a Sales Pro, which is really great. Colleen Francis, her book is called Nonstop Sales Boom. They, they all do, you know, training and speaking and they all have uh, videos that you can watch out there. Also, Trish Bertuzzi, I can't forget her, right? You never so, forget Trish. We can't forget her. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of people and I just encourage people to, to pick up some of these books and uh, when you get a chance, hear them on podcasts and elsewhere. Sounds good. Lori, if, if folks are listening and they want to reach out to you, uh, maybe they want to hire you. Maybe they want to get that list of great books written by women. Is that okay? And yeah. uh, what's your preferred uh, communication channel? Yeah, absolutely. They can find me on LinkedIn, Lori Richardson, Score More Sales, or Women Sales Pros. And we're also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Score More Sales or at Women Sales Pros. I'd be delighted to talk to anybody in your audience, Sam. Awesome. Lori, thanks so much for being on the show and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Hey everybody, Sam's Corner. I really enjoyed that conversation with Lori Richardson. I just think, you know, uh, frankly, similar to depending on your politics, I mean, it doesn't matter politics, but you know, a, a story that reminded me of, of Elizabeth Warren starting off as a single mom and a teacher and saying, you know, this isn't going to cut it and moving into sales and really experience selling so many different things 
over the course of her career. I just think it's a, it was an inspiring conversation. Obviously, I love the fact that she started Women's Sales Pros. I think that now importance, you know, the, the importance of diversity in sales is, is, is greater than ever, right? And this is not an opportunity. And I don't think it's a time when we relax our focus on diversity or inclusiveness just because we're in this terrible situation because we've seen that diversity within organizations drives better outcomes. So that that was one of the big takeaways for me is just you know how important a continued focus on diversity is. In addition to just hearing somebody's story about starting off and doing every kind of sale and really understanding that the core principles of sales really haven't changed that much. It's really about listening, asking questions and solving problems for your customers. So hope, hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Before we go, we wanna thank our sponsor Outreach. Outreach is revolutionizing customer engagement by moving away from the silo of single-threaded conversations to a streamlined and customer-centric journey. So check them out at www.outreach.io. If you want to reach out to me, you can. LinkedIn.com forward slash the word in forward slash Sam F. Jacobs. And I'll talk to you next time. Tennessee.